Well, hey, we're glad you guys are here this morning with us. Uh, today, we're uh, continuing in our series through Judges called Unlikely Saviors, and we're still in the life of Gideon. And uh, we started out in chapter 6, I believe, and uh, with his call, and then um, we saw um, uh, the deliverance uh, in chapter 7, and that today we're going to look at chapter 8. And uh, next week, uh, not so much exactly about Gideon, but sort of the effects of Gideon and, uh, and, in chapter 9. And so, y'all pray with me. This, this stretch, verses 8 and 9, and I've heard another, a couple other preachers say it, are difficult passages to preach. And so, uh, but I believe in preaching the whole counsel of God, and God leads me to preach through books of the Bible. And so, we'll do the best our can, we can with it, okay? And so, y'all pray for me. Um, uh, but um, we see the life of Gideon here in chapter 8 uh, one of God's unlikely saviors remember when Israel had no king and everyone did what was right in his own eyes and last week we saw the um, armies of Gideon army of 300 three um, uh, I guess um Divisions of a hundred defeat a hundred and thirty-five thousand Midianites uh, through with God's help, right? And uh, uh, those who weren't killed, which they really killed each other, didn't they? They fled, and that brings us to the message today in chapter eight. And so it's kind of a continued continued episode. And uh, today's message I want to share with you. I've entitled Gideon's Dangerous. Slippery slope. Okay, that's what it's about today. And so I want to, there's 35 verses in chapter 8, and we're going to read them all, but I'm not going to read them all right off the bat. We're going to hit them as we go through each section that I'm going to share with you. But I do want to read, I think, the first nine verses this morning. So follow along with me as we read from God's Word. And it says, Now the men of Ephraim said to him, why have you done this to us by not calling us when you went to fight with the Midianites? And they reprimanded him sharply. And so he said to them, What have I done now in comparison with you? Is not the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? And God has delivered into your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger toward him subsided when he said that. And when Gideon came to the Jordan, he and the 300 men who were with him crossed over, exhausted, but still in pursuit. And then he said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are exhausted, and I'm pursuing Zeba and Zalmunna, kings of Median, and the Leaders of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? And so Gideon said, For this cause, when the Lord has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with the briars. And then he went up from there to Penuel, and spoke to them in the same way, and the men of Peniel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. And so he also spoke to the men of Peniel, saying, When I come back in peace, I will tear down this tower. All right, let's stop right there. This is the word of God. Let's, let's go to the Lord in a moment of prayer together. Father, we do bow before you this morning. God, we're grateful. For your word and we're grateful for the life of Gideon and uh, God we a lot of us can see ourselves in him and God uh, but uh, Lord we pray today that you'd speak to us through your word God help us to understand your truth but most of all Lord help us see Jesus and the wonderful Savior that he is and the help that you provide when we need you Lord, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Tiger Woods is regarded as one of the greatest golfers of all time. I, I was a huge fan. I'm not so much anymore, but uh, he's the only professional golfer to have won 
four, all four majors in a row. And um, he was named the PGA Player of the Year ten times. Uh, he was uh, the PGA Money winner nine times over five years. And he was ranked the number one golfer in the world for more than five years. And, of course, he's amassed a fortune in earnings and endorsements, over a billion dollars. And uh, most of that happened when he had a beautiful family, a wife and two children. And he, he was on the top of the world. And those accomplishments probably would be even more numerous if it hadn't have been for Thanksgiving Day 2010. And everything that kind of fell apart for him on that day, his world unraveled. The public world and the private world of Tiger Woods merged. The curtain was pulled back. Scandal broke. And due to the failure of his character, Tiger Woods experienced a dramatic fall. And... Uh, we see that far too often, don't we? Not just from Tiger Woods, but from many others. And it makes us wonder, what makes a life unravel? For many in entertainment and politics and sports and, and even in church leadership, it's just all too familiar story. And, and today with social media the way it is, we hear all about it. Probably more than we should. And and, and it breaks my heart. It seems like week after week I hear about national leaders who are pastors of large churches who fall. And, and uh, of course, we all know stories like this. And, and we just ought to be thankful to the Lord that it's not us because it can happen to any of us. And sometimes it is people we love or people we know, people just like us. And sometimes um, it may even be us. But it leaves us asking, what happened? What happened? What caused their life to splinter and split? What caused their life to snap? What made it unravel? And, you know, it, it's all the more heartbreaking when we see it's someone like Gideon. And we see this several times in Scripture, don't we, with people, men used by God, King David, and here Gideon, and, and they've been greatly used by God, but they fall at the end. So what makes a life unravel like that? What makes one fall? And that's what we're looking at today in the life of Gideon. And I want, I want us to think about that. When we think about Gideon, Gideon, he was a national hero, wasn't he? He was one of those unlikely saviors. He was a judge. He's, he's listed in the great hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 32, as one who had great faith. And, and, and through God's instruction and Gideon's faithfulness and obedience, Israel saw this miraculous deliverance from the Midianites. But just like many others in Scripture and in the church and in life in general, Gideon experienced a great fall. And... Uh, we see that here in chapter 8, and, and, he, and like I said, even the effects of it even more in chapter 9. And, and the warning, the warning is there, isn't it? Take heed, lest you fall. Take heed, lest you fall. And that's what we need to do this morning. So I want to share four signs with you that we see in the life of Gideon and there's probably there's probably many many more but I summarized them into four four signs that you may be on a dangerous slippery slope in your relationship with God and I think we see these in the life of Gideon and, and so uh, bear with me as we share these with you and hopefully you guys can see them in the text but but the first one I want to share with you is this you may be on a dangerous slippery slope if you expect special treatment from other people you know, a lot of, a lot of times, uh, you know, when we, when we experience some success or we think we've made it somewhere, then we expect people to treat us differently. We expect people may, maybe to make uh, uh, um, uh, exceptions for us in certain ways or to give us gifts and, and things like that. And, 
And, and that often occurs after times of success. And what happened, you know, and you know, we face obstacles. And, and, and here in verse 1, we see the first negative obstacle, I guess, that Gideon experienced after his success with God over the Midianites uh, the, when the loaf of bread run into the Midianites' calf, you might say. So uh, in, in verse 1, we see that the men of Ephraim came to him, or he, he came to them. They came to him, I guess. And Ephraim is one of the tribes of Israel. It's one of the half-tribes, um, I, I, I believe. Uh, Manasseh and Ephraim were the tribes from, from Joseph. And, and Ephraim was one of the largest, wealthiest, most powerful tribes in Israel. And uh, their pride evidently had gotten hurt because they had found out that Gideon had went into this battle with the Midianites and they hadn't been invited. And they were a powerful army. And, and so they, they came to, uh, to um, Gideon and want the, you know, they wanted to know why they didn't get to go to battle so they could get some credit for the victory, basically. And the problem is Gideon had followed God's instructions, hadn't he? He had done things exactly like God had told him. He, God had called him and God had had him slim the troops down to near nothing. And uh, so, um, you know, God knew how they would, they would respond. And, and God, had done, God had done this. Why did he tell Gideon? So that no one in Israel could claim the glory, right? And here Ephraim is, they're upset. You know why? Because they didn't get to claim any of the glory. So God knew what he was doing, didn't he? He knew exactly what he was doing. And so these Ephraimites, they basically ream Gideon out for not calling on them to lead in the battle. But, and, and, and Gideon, he knows how powerful they are, so he don't want to upset them. So he appeases them by acknowledging their power and talking about all that they have. And, and you can kind of read and their previous victories and... And, and he didn't really seek special treatment from them, but he didn't want to engage with this huge tribe, with this powerful army with his 300. Uh, he was afraid of them, I guess. And, and so, but in the next few verses, we do see how Gideon expects special treatment from the weaker folks in Israel. And so he, when he travels to Succoth and Penuel, and verse 4 says when he came to the Jordan, so he goes to the Jordan River, and he crosses back over east, and that's where the tribe of um, Gad is in Israel, and that's where the city of Succoth is found. And uh, he's going there to feed his armies because of their recent victory over the Midianites, and they're chasing those 10,000 or so that are left, I think, or 15,000, I can't remember exactly, um, that are left, that had fled, and they're trying to take care of them, and and so he goes into Succoth and he asked them to feed him, feed his armies. But they weren't impressed by his recent victory over the Midianites, evidently, uh, because they basically said, hey, these two kings, Zeba and Zalmunna, are still on the loose. And uh, we're not going to feed you because I think, you know, these two guys had led raids in Israel and they had experienced their wrath before. And so they wouldn't feed Gideon and his armies because I'm sure they were afraid that if these two kings found out that they had helped Gideon, then when they come back, they had treated them that much worse, right? And so that's what they were afraid of. And so then Gideon, he travels to another nearby city of Penuel. And, and Penuel is a city that's in the territory of the tribe of Asher of Israel. And so... Uh, that, that's where Penuel is. And so, again, he expected some special treatment from these people, and he wanted, uh, he wanted them to feed them, but they refused for exactly the same reasons. And, um, and so they were also probably afraid they'd be treated worse than at first if Gideon did not bring back these two kings. And so, so what happened then, you see how Gideon expected some special treatment from these two cities. Feed us. Look what we've done. We've, we've ran off the Midianites. But they wouldn't, they wouldn't concede. And so look what Gideon did. He threatened both of these cities who refused to help him. And he says when he comes back, he's going to tear the men of Succoth, 
their flesh with thorns and briars. And for the men of Penuel, he's going to tear down their tower. And we see he winds up doing more than that. So he's threatening them. But we see this, that Gideon felt privileged and he expected special treatment. And, you know, a lot of times people who've had some success, they, they get that way, don't they? They, they expect to be acknowledged and, um, and, and taken care of. Uh, a Chicago bank once asked for a letter of recommendation for a young Bostonian who was being considered for employment. And the Boston Investment House could not say enough about this young man. His, his father, they wrote, was a Cabot. His mother was a Lowell. Further back was a happy blend of the salt and stalls, the Peabody's, and other of Boston's finest families. His recommendation was given without hesitation. And several days later, the Chicago bank sent notice, or sent a note saying the information supplied was altogether inadequate. It read like this. It said, we're not contemplating using the young man for breeding, just for work. <laughs> so you see, it seems that often because of pedigree or, or success folks get an entitlement attitude and we're all probably too familiar with that and sometimes sometimes pastors get that way and uh, you know I've heard stories and I'm sure it's happened to me and and uh, you know if you've got a story about me let me know but uh, but uh, but you know if their church is the biggest in town or or even they, they, a lot of times are even worse if it's the biggest in the state if they've had some success and it's really grown and that kind of thing Listen to me, and this goes for all of us, and I want you to understand this. When, when you're at your lowest, it's easy to cry out to God because that's all we can do sometimes. But I want you to understand that some of the hardest terrain to navigate in the spiritual realm is that of what the world deems success. When all's going great, I, I think that may have gotten to Gideon. A little bit of success. And, and even though God was the one behind the victory, it seems like Gideon, he seems like he's entitled a little bit, doesn't it? And, and, be, and so beware lest you fall into this trap because the saying is true. The bigger they are, the harder they fall. See, that was when y'all were supposed to say that for me. Okay, maybe I'll get it next time. But, uh, but you know, and Scripture confirms this. In, in Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. And so uh, we see that, I think, a little bit. Gideon had developed a proud spirit and he's stepped onto a slippery slope towards his downfall. And uh, this is a warning for all of us to stay close to the Lord, especially during times of victory and success. Because think about this cycle of the judges. When things are going well, that's when they begin to fall away from God. Time and time again, when things are going well, they slip away from God. And that's what happens to Gideon here, isn't it? Things are going well, he steps on a slippery slope, he slides away from his relationship with the Lord. And Satan would like nothing more than to see you fall and destroy. He wants that for you. And let me tell you, you are in danger of falling when you feel entitled and expect special treatment from others, you're at a bad place. Another sign you may be in danger is not only that, but, but you are in danger of falling when you exact vengeance upon dissenters. And when you want to get revenge, when, when you can't stand it when people disagree with you, or people won't do what you want, and those kind of things, when people hurt you and you want revenge. And, and so now we see Gideon's army descend on these 15,000 or so that were left of the Midianites. And they defeat them as well. And, and uh, we see in verse 10, now Zeba and Zalmunna were at Karkor and their armies with them, about 15,000. All who were left of all the army of the people of the east, for 120,000 men who drew the sword had fallen. So... This is the last 15,000. Then Gideon went up by the road of those who dwell in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbaha, and he attacked the army while the camp felt secure. 
So here's more victory for the 300 over 15,000 that we don't even know exactly how it all happened, but it's still pretty amazing, isn't it? And God's hand's still using him, I guess. And, and when Zeba and Zalmunna, these two kings of Median, fled, he pursued them and took them and routed the whole army. And so that's what happened. And uh, in the next few verses, we see Gideon then returning to Succoth and Penuel, those two cities he just visited, just like he promised, for vengeance. And we see his vengeance. Follow along with me as I read it. He says, Then Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from battle from the ascent of, the, of Hears, and he called a young man of uh, Succoth and interrogated him, and he wrote down for him the leaders of Succoth and its elders. Seventy-seven men. So Gideon captures this guy and says, All right, who's leading the city of Succoth? They're, they're getting it. They're in for it. I want names. And so he gives them to him. And he came to the men of Succoth and said, Here are Zeba and Zalmunna, the ones that they asked for. And Gideon was there. The reason they wouldn't feed him because he didn't have these guys. And about whom you see, he's upset because why? They ridiculed me, saying, See, be careful when people poke fun at you and hurt you because if you're, if you're not careful, you'll want to take vengeance out on them. I know. I mean, it's hard. I, I, it, it's hard. And, 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 but, but now he says, the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna are now in your hand what, that we should give bread to your weary men. And look what he did in verse 16. And he took the elders of the city and the thorns of the wilderness and briars and with them, he taught the men of Succoth. So he basically whipped them with, with bushes of thorns. That's what he did. And he tore down the tower of Penuel and killed the men of that city. And so note the violence here. <laughs> you know, really, I mean, this once timid and humble leader who was hesitant to even go to battle. Now, He's not being led of God here. He's acting out of anger because of being rejected and poked fun at. Now, that's not a Christ-like move right there, folks. That's not. And, and so he returns to Succoth, and he beats the elders of the city, 70-something of them, it says, with thorn bushes. That had to hurt, didn't it? Of course, he's not doing it. His 300 men are doing it to these 70, I guess, and... And uh, then he goes to Penuel, a nearby city in Asher, and tears down a tower that's in that city, just like he said he would. And he killed all the men there. That's vengeance. That's revenge. Why? Because they wouldn't feed him and his men. See that? At this point, listen to me, at this point, he's no better than the Midianites that he delivered Israel from, is he? He's become like them. And so uh, verse 18 it says, And he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? And so they answered, As you are, so were they. That each one resembled a son of a king. And, and then he said, Gideon says, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother, and as the Lord lives, if you let them live, I would not kill you. If you had let them live, I would not kill you. And he said to Jather, his firstborn, rise and kill them. But the youth would not draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was still a youth. So he's probably a teenager, maybe 12, 13, I guess, something like that maybe. So Zeba and Zalmunna said, rise yourself and kill us, for as a man is, so is his strength. And so Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna and took the crescent ornaments that were on their camel's necks. All right. So Gideon confronts these kings, and somehow it seems as if he knew that they had killed his brothers. Do you get that? He's chased these two guys down because he knows somehow. Words got back to him, I believe, that they've killed his brothers. And that may be what this is all about. And then he tries to get his son, his, his youth, his, his oldest son, but who's still a youth, to put him to death because to be killed by a woman or a boy was humiliating to 
a king or to a soldier. And so he wanted to humiliate them as much as possible. But the youth, his son, couldn't muster the courage, so Gideon executes him himself. And it almost seems like this whole episode that we're reading about here was for Gideon, the whole reason was for him to exact vengeance for his brothers. That's what, it seems like it may have been what it was all about. Did he really care anything about anything else at this point? You know, uh, listen to me. When you are driven for revenge against those who've stood against you, you are on a dangerous, slippery slope. Anytime you garner that type of attitude toward another person, you are in danger of going down a difficult spiritual road. The Bible says vengeance belongs to the Lord. In Romans 12, 19, it says, Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it's written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. You see, the Lord, our God, is the only righteous judge, isn't he? We talked about that a little bit last week in our Wednesday night class. And we looked at John chapter 8, the Gospel of John. So it, it, it's strange, really, the links that some people will go to in order to pay somebody back for a betrayal, isn't it? Oh, man. Some people will kill themselves just so someone else suffers for hurting them before. You know? That's not, that's not Jesus, is it? <laughs> But it's crazy what some people do. Just to, just to poke back or get back. I, I heard a story about years ago, a, a former Chicago Cubs outfielder named Andre Dawson. He was fined $1,000 for arguing with an umpire, uh, Joe West, about a, a, a strike call. And so they fined him. And on the memo of his check, Dawson wrote, Donation for the Blind. It's what he wrote. So, <laughs> and so that, that was the only way he could get back at him. And I thought it was hilarious. But, but you'll do whatever you can just to poke back or get back or hurt someone sometimes. And so Dawson was doing what he could to strike back at one who stood against him. And friends, when your heart is filled with an attitude of revenge, you are in danger of falling. So beware, take heed, lest you fall. Another sign you may be in danger of falling is this. When you embrace an ungodly position of power. <laughs> and so we see this in the life of Gideon. It, 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 you know, it, it, well, let's read verse 22. It says, Then the men of Israel, they came to Gideon after all this. So now Gideon's taking care of all the Midianites. And so they don't have to worry about him at all. Him and his army. And they came to Gideon and they said, Rule over us, both you and your son and your grandson also, for you've delivered us from the hand of Midian. So you see what's happening here, right? They want Gideon to be their king and his, his uh, progeny to be the successors. And so they're trying to set up a, a monarchy here in Israel. But, but God's intention, as we know from the beginning, was for Israel not to be a monarchy, but to be a what? A theocracy, where God alone is king. And we see, you know, Gideon's response is awesome. In verse 23, Gideon said, I will not rule over you, nor will my son rule over you, the Lord. See that all caps? That's Yahweh. That's, that's the great I am. That's the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Let him rule over you, you see. And that's an awesome response. Gideon said the right thing. But in the following verses, even though we see Gideon said the right thing, his action didn't say the right thing. And so then Gideon said to him in verse 24, he said, I'd like to make a request of you, though. I don't want to be your king, but if each one of you would give me the earrings from his plunder, for they had gold earrings because they were Ishmaelites. And so they answered, we will gladly give them. And they spread out a garment, and every, all the men threw their earrings 
on the garment. And now the weight of the gold of the earrings he requested was 1,700 shekels of gold. And this is besides the crescent ornaments, pendants, and the purple robes, which were on the kings of Midian. So he got more than that. And then also the chains that were around the camel's necks. Now, I don't know if they put gold chains around the camel's necks or not, but you know, maybe they were rappers. I don't know. But, uh, but basically, Gideon taxed them like a king would. That's what he's doing. They've come back and they've killed all these Midianites. They've taken everything from these Midianites. And, and the weight of the earrings alone in gold, <clears throat> if I figured this up right, was worth about $1.7 million today. That's what Gideon got. Plus the rest of the stuff. It's a pretty good payoff. I want you to note also, the, well, I already mentioned that the camels wore jewelry, and he took that, but also note the mention of the crescent ornaments and pendants. I just want to put that out. It's been mentioned more than once now. And, and, and if you, if, I found that interesting, the crescent imagery, because that's in the symbol of Islam. And um, uh, most, of the, m most Muslims are descendants of these Arab tribes and, many, and, and descendants of Ishmael and, and so on and Esau and things like that. And, and um, you know, research shows that that crescent moon early on in the days of Abraham and following represented the worship of the moon god. And, of course, people in Islam, they'll deny that. You know, but but that's that's the truth. But 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 nevertheless, Gideon taxed them, and he profited from them like a king. Even if he acted like he didn't want to be king, he's behaving a lot like a king. And so, uh, look at verse twenty-seven. Then it says Gideon made it into an ephod. Ephod, I guess is the best way to pronounce it. And he set it up in his city, Ophrah. And uh, all Israel played the harlot with it there, and it became a snare to Gideon in his house. You see what's going on here? You see this ephod uh, he made is, is, is likely, it's a way of him setting up his own place of worship. That's what he's doing, because an ephod was the vest that God described in the law to be worn only by a high priest in the presence of God when he went in to uh, make the sacrifices in the temple. That was for the priest. Only men from the tribe of Levi were to wear that. And, and uh, only in the tabernacle. And only when they were making petitions on behalf of the people. And, and so Gideon says, you know what? We're not going to go to the temple. We're going to make our own place of worship. And we're going to make our own ephod. And um, he made his own version of that. And he might not have been trying to deny God all out, but he's put himself in the place of God and taken upon himself privileges that belong only to God and now is directing people's attention away from the one true God and the place God has given them to worship and to do it here in his way. And, and so one of the biggest problems they had was syncretism, and I think that's what's taking place here, and that's where they worship the one true God, or they try to, but they also worship all the gods of the Canaanites, Canaanites along with him. They just blend it all together. And look at verse 28. Then it says, Thus Midian was subdued before the children of Israel so that they lifted their heads no more, and the country was quiet for 40 years in the days of Gideon. So here we see, this is kind of the way most of the other stories of the judges have ended, uh, that there was a time of peace and then... You know, the cycle began. But now here, we don't see the inclusion of the word peace. It just says it was quiet. So I think that's probably intentional. I guess there were no invasions by foreigners, but the spiritual fall that usually took place after these judges had died had already begun in the life of Gideon. While Gideon's still living, they're starting to fall away. They're sliding down this slippery slope away from God and Gideon was a powerful influence over the people of Israel, and that's part of the reason why. And then in verse 29 it says, Then Jerubbaal, 
the son of Joash, that's Gideon. Remember, that's Gideon. Jerubbaal, that's Gideon. That's, that's the nickname they gave to him. It says, let Baal contend for himself. He went down and he dwelled in his own house. And in verse 30 it says, Gideon had 70 sons who were his own offspring, for he had many wives, and he had a concubine in Shechem who also bore him a son whose name he called Abimelech. So Gideon had a he had a harem, didn't he? A bunch of wives. That's what kings did, wasn't it? That's how kings lived. And so, although Gideon says he didn't want to be a king, he's he's uh, acting like a king, isn't he? And get this, he had this son with his concubine, which basically is a woman on the side, right? He's not married to her, but. But uh, she's his, sort of like his property. And he had this son with her, and he called, they called him Abimelech. You know what Abimelech, if you translate it from Hebrew directly to English, you know what that means? <laughs> My father is king. That's his name. <laughs> so don't tell me Gideon not acting like a king. He named his boy. My daddy's king. So he's trying to get a point across here, I guess. And so even though he wasn't technically king, he lived like a king and he used this ungodly position of power that God had not reserved for him. And, and it, you know, after tearing down the altars of Baal, you know what Gideon means? If you translate Gideon, Gideon means hacker. And not like a computer hacker. More like a wood chopper. You know what I'm saying? That's what Gideon means. And when you read about him tearing down the altars of Baal, that's what it says is he hacked it down. He hacked it down. And he went from hacking down the altars of Baal on his father's property to raising up a place of worship at his place where people basically do exactly the same thing. He sets up this, his own place of worship and it's a slippery slope away from a right relationship with God. That's, that's where Gideon is. That's what's happened. Proverbs 10, 29 says, The way of the Lord is strength for the upright, but the destruction will come, will come to workers of iniquity. And that's where Gideon's found himself, a worker of iniquity. He's on a downward trend. And he's taking everybody else with him. And that, that's what we'll talk about here in a second. Hey, listen, embracing a position for money or power or prestige is a dangerous way to put yourself on a slippery slope. And a lot of times people do anything for the right amount of money or the right, right amount of power or the right amount of influence. They'll do just about anything. And, and that's where Gideon found himself. He's on a, on a slippery slope. If, if, if you're not careful... You love the things of this world more than you love God and His will and His ways. And when you do, you are in danger of a great fall, my friends. When you embrace an un ungodly position of power, you're on a slippery slope that will lead you away from God. One more sign I want to share with you this morning that you're in a dangerous place. And that's when your example leads others astray. If you're not leading people to Jesus, you're leading them away from Jesus. You hear me? You're either pointing them to Christ, and if you're not pointing them to him, you might as well be pointing them away from him. And I look at verse 32. It says, Now Gideon, the son of Joash, died at a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash, his father, in Ophrah of the Abizarites. And so it was, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel again played the harlot with the Baals and made Baal Barith their God. And so we've read that over and over again through the Judges, haven't we? Before Gideon, we read that after each judge died, Israel slowly drifted away from exclusive worship of God. But with Gideon, it seems like it was already taking place that Gideon himself was leading them astray by his own actions. For certain, as soon as he died, they slid, Israel slid down this slippery slope away from God and began worshiping the gods of the Canaanites once again. And notice verses 34 and 35 as we read the last two verses of this chapter. He says, 
Thus the children of Israel, get this, did not remember the Lord their God. I'll tell you what, when my time's over, I don't want the people behind me to not even be able to remember the Lord our God. That's not why I'm here. That's not what we're trying to do. And, 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 and that's where Gideon is. That's where he's found himself. And they, <laughs> they didn't even remember the Lord their God who had delivered them from the hands of all their enemies on every side. And they didn't show kindness to the house of Zer Jerubbaal, that is Gideon, in accordance with the good he had done for Israel. So not only did they not remember God, they didn't treat Gideon's descendants well. And Gideon... You know, his sons and his grandsons are going to be king like him, but it didn't happen that way, did it? Why? Because Gideon's fall was great. That's why. He didn't get what he wanted. Remember, before Gideon was called, the sermon the prophet preached before Gideon, you know, all that now is falling on deaf ears. They don't even remember any of that. And, and uh, you know, and once again, the people forgot the Lord. They didn't show faithfulness to the family of Gideon. Though sinful and flawed, Gideon had saved Israel by God's power, hadn't he? God had delivered them from the Midianites because Gideon was obedient and faithful to do what God taught him to do. He called his army down to 300. And if he hadn't done that, they probably wouldn't have won. You know, he did it exactly like God told him to do. Gideon had saved Israel by God's power, yet the people reject the Lord and return to their idolatry, and they don't care about Gideon's family after all he's done for them. And in Gideon's case, like I said, it seems like it began before he died. He was leading them down that slippery slope with him. And, and, uh, but once you're on a slippery slope, the, the destruction's inevitable. Gideon fell, and the nation he had once delivered under God's power fell with him. And that's what happens a lot of times when you fall. You grab hold of everybody that's around you and they go with you. And that's what happened with Gideon. As soon as we forget all the Lord has done for us, we quickly move back into our sinful ways, back into our idolatrous habits, and our fall is great. During 1978, during a fireman strike in England, the British Army took over emergency firefighting. And they were called out to, by an elderly lady in South London to help retrieve her cat. Of course, they got there with impressive haste. They very clear, clear, cleverly and carefully rescued the cat. And they started to drive away, but the lady was so grateful, she invited all these heroes in for a cup of tea. You know, like they do in London. But later, after their cup of tea as they drove off and they shouted their farewells and waving their arms, they ran over the cat. Sorry about that one. I told you it was PG-13. Even the illustrations, I guess. You see, they thought everything was well. They'd done their duty. All was going well. But the very one they came to save Wound up destroyed. That's what happened with Gideon. He, he, he came to save the nation of Israel. He saved them from the Midianites. But because of his fall, he led them away from God. That's what happened. He destroyed them. Gideon thought he was okay. He decided to abandon God and do things his way at some point. And, and this is not only... It didn't only lead to his downfall, but it led to the downfall of the entire nation of Israel. And so when you are straying away from the Lord, one way you can tell that you are on a downward spiral away from the Lord is that you're determined to bring people with you. It happens. Be careful, my friends. 1 Corinthians 10, 12 says, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. Folks, Gideon, he was an unlikely savior. He was, he was a humble, timid man who was hesitant 
to step into the role of Savior and Deliverer of Israel when God had called him to. He, 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 God, but when he did, God gave him victory in an unusual and powerful way that showed God's power was at work in his life. Yet eventually Gideon, Gideon seemed to want all the credit and all the rewards for the win. But the glory belongs to God. We saw that last week. And in much the same way, the Lord Jesus Christ is our Savior. And he's loved you and he's delivered you from sin and death and the grave. And, and his spirit indwells you and empowers you, if you're one of his, for service. But yet, you and I, we still exist in this sin-cursed fleshly body that tempts us at every, every, every angle, every, every opportunity. And if you give in to its desires, it will lead you down a slippery slope away from God. Take heed, lest you fall. The good news is this, no matter how quickly you may be falling, no matter how hard you may feel like you're going to hit, the Lord Jesus is able and ready to rescue you and set you on solid ground and give you hope, give you a future, and restore you. And so that's, that's what you need to do today. Maybe there's some folks here today that, that you're falling, you're slipping away, and you know in your heart that you're drifting away from God. And it's showing up, and just like with Gideon, he stopped, he stopped seeking the Lord for direction. He just started doing things his own way. If that describes your life, you're stepping onto a slippery slope, my friend. You better spend time in the Word and in, and in prayer and seek God's will for your life. And seek His direction. You know, if you feel like, feel like uh, uh, you know, the world owes you something, if you're always seeking to get revenge for people that, that, uh, that hurt you or said something about you, all those things are signs, folks. Take heed. Call out to Jesus. He'll rescue you. You're, you're, you're sliding, but he'll grab you and pick you up. He'll set you on a solid place, and he'll set things right. Will you do that this morning? Maybe you need to do that for the first time. You give your heart and life to Jesus, and he'll save you from your sins and give you hope and a future in him. Now's the time to do that. Let's, let's bow our heads. Let's pray. Let's respond in faith this morning as God leads us and calls us. Father, we do bow before you right now, God, and we pray that you'd have your way in every heart. God, that uh, we would help one another, that we would come to each other's aid, Lord, that we would help one another and that we would all take heed lest we fall like Gideon. So help us, Jesus. Save souls, change lives, and make us like you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Come on as we sing together.